Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Digital Divide and Remote Service Delivery. My name is Anaga Joshi, the C I'm a Senior Research Officer in the Knowledge Translation and Impact Team at ACE. So this is my first webinar and I'm thrilled to be facilitating today on this really important and relevant topic right now. But before I begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking to you today in Melbourne. And I'd also like to pay my respect to elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians attending this webinar today. Last year has been a transformative year for many in the child, family and well-being sector. Not only were many services required to adopt to remote service delivery or telepractice, there was also an increase in the demand for many of these services in the sector. As 2020 became a year of trial and error, we now want to take this as a chance to really look back and reflect. Today we want to discuss the research evidence and practitioner experience of remote service delivery, the challenges faced, especially those relating to digital access and literacy, and also we wanted to get a, a chance to discuss the possible solutions of the common hurdles to telepractice as well. Joining me today, we have Joe Barricott, Distinguished Professor and Director for the Centre for Social Impact Sumben and Sumben University of Technology. As a member of the Di Australian Digital Inclusion Index team, Joe explores the social ex economy and the social political effects of online technologies and is particularly interested in long-term interest in the use of online technologies by non-for-profit and social economy organisations. So welcome Joe. Hi, Annika. All the way from Darwin, we have Catherine Bannister, the Communities for Children team leader at Australian Red Cross in Darwin. Catherine's experience with rural and remote service delivery in, to Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities is, is extensive. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And last but not least, we have Annette Nishu, Director of Policy and Practice at the Parenting Research Centre. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, Annette has been leading a range of PRC collaborations with community and government agencies to improve resources for telepractice, so practitioners are able to provide quality, accessible services remotely. Hopefully all of you have had the chance to complete the telepractice quiz, which we've been including in our event promo. Annette will be revealing some of the early findings to that survey today. Uh, so welcome Annette. Thank you and hello everybody, lovely to be here. So um, I thought we can uh, s get the ball rolling and um, I'll hand over to Joe to set the scene for us today. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Aniga. And, um... I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm also on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge their elders and pay my respects. Um, this is a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart. My job this afternoon is to provide um, the broad scene setting uh, regarding digital inclusion in Australia. And uh, my esteemed panellists are going to talk in more detail about problems and solutions of um, digital exclusion in relation to remote services delivery. Although I'll touch on that slightly in my own work, uh, in referring to my own work as well. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about digital inclusion at two levels. First, at the level of individual citizens, and then also thinking about uh, digital inclusion and exclusion and the digital divide in relation to community sector organisations in uh, specifically in the not-for-profit sector more broadly. So I guess the first thing I want to do is just define what digital inclusion is. Uh, and there are multiple definitions of it, and I'm sure amongst this audience there'll be some different experiences of what constitutes digital inclusion. In our work in the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, uh, which my team contributes to in partnership with uh, Telstra and RMIT, and the project is led by Professor Julian Thomas from RMIT, we understand digital inclusion as being able to use digital technologies as a channel to improve skills, to enhance quality of life, to drive education and promote economic participation and wellbeing across all elements of, of society. So in many ways, uh, not surprisingly, digital inclusion is really about forms of social and economic inclusion. Obviously, we live in a digital world 
and um, digital capability is intimately bound up now with um, other aspects of inclusion. When we talk about digital inclusion, and I'm um, moving on to the first substantive slide in the handouts that I provided, uh, which is a slide from the uh, Digital Inclusion Index 2020 report. When we talk about digital inclusion, we think about it in terms of three specific dimensions. Um, the first two are probably very um, familiar to all of you, and they relate particularly to access. Um, and access to, di to um, digital technologies is about having access to the devices through which uh, you use uh, online uh, capability. Also having different locations. So for me as a professional, I've got multiple um, locations, although not during lockdown, um, in accessing the internet, whereas someone, for example, who's outside of work might not have the same uh, level of access to different locations. The second element is affordability. And um, that won't be any surprise to any of you that um, being able to afford um, our access is important in promoting our digital inclusion. And the third element is the ability to use online technologies in productive ways. And that includes the ability to use online technologies to meet our needs as consumers, but also our capacity to produce content in cyberspace when that's appropriate for our social world, our professional world, our um, cultural world. In the first slide that I've shared there, um, it shows the trend data for digital inclusion for Australian people. Now, this is not organisational data, this is individual Australians. And as you can see over time, our overall co collective digital inclusion has increased uh, quite considerably uh, since 2014. But what you can also see in the figures there is that affordability has actually gone through periods of decline during that period. And that's not to do with the unit price of data access, which has actually dropped in real terms over that time. What it's to do with is that we're more and more online. So we're chewing up more and more data. And so the cost of being uh, digitally included has gone up overall. Um, uh, in 2020 though, that, um, that trend did start to drop down just a little bit again. And then I guess the other thing to point out from that trend data is that um, digital ability uh, is increasing, uh, not at the same rate as access, um, and it also started from a lower base. So collectively, our digital ability is not as great um, as uh, other aspects of our digital inclusion. If I move on to the second uh, substantive slide that I provided, that's uh, that image of Australia, and um, it shows you the geography of digital inclusion in Australia. You can see uh, from those data, and by all means, feel free to look at the full reports, which give a lot more information, that the ACT is the most digitally included state or territory in Australia, and Tasmania and South Australia tend to be the least digitally included in every year that we've conducted the index. The other thing that's not as well represented in this slide but is available in the reports is that um, there's a pronounced country city divide in digital inclusion and definitely a pronounced um, country city um, rural remote divide. Um, these patterns of inclusion largely mirror other national measures of socioeconomic advantage in Australia. So the ACT may not surprise you, often turns up as the most um, uh, advantaged uh, territory or state in Australia. In relation to today's discussion, though, there is one important caveat in relation to the Australian Digital Inclusion Index to date. Um, the index has until this year been based upon the Roy Morgan single source survey data, which has been the most useful and available to us um, data set to uh, measure digital inclusion in Australia. However, because of the data collection regions that Roy Morgan use, our samples from remote areas are very small and it doesn't give the full picture um, of how people in remote com communities are experiencing digital inclusion. So for those of you who um, mm. are working, for example, with remote Indigenous communities, you might wonder about the level of digital inclusion in Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland. This is probably an effect of bias in the data rather than um, a really true picture of those remote community experiences. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Catherine and Annette about some of the concrete detail uh, about those experiences. And I note in the reports from the Digital Inclusion Index that we have done some case studies year to year to try and um, fill out some of the blanks that the data um, has. Um, 
perhaps not surprisingly, as I said before, we do find that those digital inclusion patterns tend to mirror socioeconomic demographic patterns more broadly. Uh, and so in the third substantive slide that I've provided, you can see the bar graph. Um, and this shows you that digital inclusion varies considerably by age, education levels, income levels, employment status and cultural and linguistic diversity. Although in relation to cultural and linguistic diversity, it's sometimes surprising to people that as a group, um, this group of Australians are more digitally included. That relates to the huge diversity in what constitutes a, a fairly blunt instrument for de defining diversity. Obviously, um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds include um, skilled migrants as well as uh, refugees and people seeking asylum. And also because people are, are physically away from home, they do actually tend to use the internet a lot uh, to maintain social and family connections. Um, the gap um, between uh, low and high income earners is particularly notable. That's widened since 2014. And the education gap remains significant. So for people who did not complete secondary school, um, they scored 49.4 um, in the last uh, Digital Inclusion Index measure, which was 17.2 points lower than the national average. We're also aware, and it's become you know, a fairly pertinent issue during uh, lockdown periods across the country, that um, uh, single uh, parent families uh, tend to be less digitally included. Uh, and that um, uh, younger people, children and younger people who are from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds are tending to fall behind um, more at, a, more at a faster rate than those who are not from those backgrounds. The other thing to note in relation, is in relation to age. People aged 65 plus are the most digitally excluded group in Australia with both affordability and digital ability relatively low for that group. We also know that 4 million Australians access the internet solely through a mobile connection. And these people have lower digital inclusion overall, largely due to the affordability issues of accessing the internet only through a mobile phone. That's quite important in terms of um, services delivery because mobile only users in Australia tend to be people who are experiencing other forms of um, exclusion and particularly people who are experiencing homelessness, young people, and people in remote communities tend to be using um, uh, mobile only technology more than others. So I guess the point of these demographic data is to, uh, from a um, community services delivery perspective is, you know, raising our awareness about those groups that we seek to serve, uh, often having uh, the least access to the technologies through which we're now um, providing quite a lot more um, services than we have in the past. So if I move on from individuals to uh, community organisations and not-for-profit sector, um, uh, we do see that um, there's uh, also patterns of organisational level digital inclusion and exclusion. Again, probably not surprising to those of you who work in uh, many of these organisations, but possibly there's some insights from these three different um, forms of exclusion for people to think about. Uh, if you look at the final substantive slide that I've provided, um, that uh, infographic is from the Info Exchange Group's Digital Technology in the Not-for-Profit Sector 2020 uh, survey, which is a survey that Connecting Up previously and now Connecting Up and, and Info Exchange have been conducting for a number of years. And um, it's, a sur it's survey data on uh, the digital participation and technology access of the not-for-profit sector. Um, the full picture um, for service delivery really does require us to look at those who deliver services as well as those who uh, receive services. So the main points um, to be pulling out here, which won't be a surprise to those of you who are doing the work, um, is that we can see that um, while some community sector and other not-for-profit organisations certainly are innovating in their use of digital technologies, many struggle with basic access to the right hardware um, the affordability challenges of being um, digitally uplifted uh, and the abilities of their staff and volunteers to make the best use of technologies that are available. Um, these issues have also been reflected in the pulse of the four purpose sur sector survey that um, the Centre for Social Impact ran late last year, where 49% of not-for-profit staff um, reported being less than confident using technology and information systems. 
So past research I've conducted um, also as part of the Giving Australia research team also found that more than 20% of not-for-profit organisations don't have their own website. And that's particularly the case for smaller community-based organisations. Facebook's decision last week, which saw hundreds of not-for-profits communication channels smashed and not all restored since, shows the vulnerability of those organisations who are relying on commercial platforms to manage their digital presence. From a service delivery perspective, the digital exclusion of these organisations creates some very real challenges. Of course, many of these organisations are used to con um, confronting such challenges head on and devising workarounds and solutions within their lean resources. I'm happy now to stop and to pass on to Catherine to hear about a coalface experience during COVID-19 restrictions and the organisation's response. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Jo. Um, so, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm privileged to be presenting from the lands of the Latakia people, who are the original and unceded owners of the lands and seas around Darwin. I pay res my respects to their ancestors who cared for this area for so many generations before my people arrived. I pay respects to their leaders who still have strong and intimate knowledge of the land and stories today and have the daunting challenge of raising their young people under challenging circumstances. I also pay my respect to the upcoming leaders who are their children and the youth of today um, and extend this respect to any other First Nations people who are participating in the webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, and then some context about, uh, some people will know the um, Australian Red Cross is one of 52 communities for children facilitating partners across Australia. It's a program funded by the Department of Social Services, Federal Department. Um, and we're funded to work with communities to provide activities for families and children under 12 years old. And we base this on decisions of a local committee and in accordance with community and a community informed strategic plan. So Red Cross doesn't actually deliver the activities usually, um, but we have contracts with other organisations known as community partners to deliver the activities. Um, and we have two distinct uh, uh, and contrasting geographical areas that we work with. We work with the Tiwi Islands um, off the coast of Darwin and Palmerston, which is a satellite town of Darwin. So just a bit of context about the Tiwi Islands. They're um, 80 kilometres off the north coast of Darwin across the Arrow of Eura Sea. They're pretty easily accessible normally by air and by sea. Um, there's a regular ferry um, there's about 3,000 people who live there and there are three main communities plus many homelands where people live or visit. Um, the main community is Wurumiyunga, which is on Bathurst Island um, and is probably the most well known. And um, Wurumiyunga has a population of maybe 2,000 people, of about 2,000 people. Um, and the other communities on Melville Island are smaller, but they're still important hubs for their surrounding lands. Almost 100% of the population are Tiwi speaking families, Tiwi culture being one of Australia's many um, longest living cultures on earth. So, and to the people, the uh, keeping of their language and culture is really important. Um, and, and in fact, it's important legacy for all of us. Um, there are extremely high levels of vulnerability we know of that are based on the uh, AECD, Australian Early Child Development Index um, data, and also CIFA data. And, you know, just broadly speaking, there are about 42% of children who are vulnerable in, in one or more area when they start school. Um, and it's a very young population. The whole Northern Territory has a young population, um, about 44% of people being under 30 years old, which is much higher than the Australian average. And on the islands and in Palmerston, we're looking at 49% of people under 30. Um, and we know that in Southern Australia, those people are pretty digitally literate, but it's not quite the same up here. Um, 
on the Tiwi Islands, we have got three community depart partners delivering four activities. Um, the islands are relying on satellite digital technology, although some government services have recently connected to a fibre optic undersea cable, um, but apparently this isn't available to the NGOs or to the community members. So a couple of, of government services, NT government services have now got great um, access to technology, but not us. Um, regular mobile phone and internet outages occur, especially in the wet season. And the outages can last for, out for from hours, a few hours, half a day, or days on end. And in my memory, the, uh, the longest time has been five days. And during that time, people are unable to access ATMs, um, to buy food or fuel unless they have cash, uh, make phone calls, access emails or databases, such as that database is used by Centrelink. Uh, there's no place that I know of in any of the communities where people can have free Wi-Fi access. Um, and yeah, that's very different to Palmerston. Palmerston is the satellite town of Darwin. It's like only 30 minutes away from the Darwin CBD. It's got a population of something like 34,000. Um, and we think of it uh, as being kind of two towns in one, in a way there's, there's high levels of affluence, but there's also high levels of disadvantage. Um, the disadvantage is concentrated predominantly in four key suburbs. Um, and this we know from AECD and CIFA data as well. And these suburbs are the focus of most of our CIFA C activities. But we also know that um, there are, you know, people who need access to our activities from other suburbs and transport there is a challenge because for, for young families. Um, about 21% of the school children in Palmerston are from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. And um, there's also um, maybe about 6% of people from um, non-English speaking background families who've moved there. Um, there's also a young population, as I've said, um, and, and we have five community partners there delivering 12 activities over the course of the year. Um, all of Palmerston is NBN enabled, although many homes on Centrelink support can't afford regular access to the internet and rely on their mobile phone data bundles for data. Um, the City of Palmerston Council, who are absolutely fabulous community-minded council offers free Wi-Fi access in the CBD and it's pretty highly used by um, young people, um, homeless people and um, some of us when we're in the area. Um, we've fortunately been spared the bad impacts of bushfires that many people in the south have experienced than they, compared to other states but we've and, and compared to other states, we've had really low impacts of COVID, but we have had shutdown times in Palmerston. We had it between the 24th of March and the 13th of May, a couple of solid months of people staying at home and which challenged all our services to work out how to deliver connection and um, some resources. On the Tiwi Islands, we had a longer period because the area was declared a biosecurity zone between the 16th of March and the 11th of June. So for three months, um, we couldn't send any fly-in, fly-out workers. I couldn't go there. Um, and a lot of the specialists that work in our activities couldn't go there. Um, and there are very contrasting reactions to um, technology um, due to access issues, but also cultural issues. So the fastest adapters were the Palmerston Early Childhood play groups, especially those who already used Facebook and Facebook groups as connectors. Um, as most people know, that's one of the goals of, of groups is to connect people's families socially so that they have more support from each other. Um, and Playgroup NT was um, a very early adopter there and people found themselves surprised that they were just as good as play school presenters and they'd pre-record stories, songs uh, and craft, art and craft activities and load them up to share with their families. Um, and But they didn't let that stand alone. They also um, followed up with phone calls to just 
help reduce the isolation that families might have if they're at home alone with their children. And they also followed it up with um, packages of art and craft supplies and some of them were even more progressive and also did um, hamper drops. Um, we had a fantastic partnerships with Food Bank for that. Um, uh, other partners were not willing to use Facebook. They're concerned about security issues, but they also they use messenger groups and mobile phones for connection and communication. Um, they did the, as much as they could to be able to see the children and, and continue to communicate with the children um, you know, as a child safe practice, but also a, oh, I guess it's digital literacy as well as um, you know, maintain the connection so that when the services resumed, they weren't forgotten and the children were still aware that they were out there. Um, the success of all those communications leveraged off the existing um, trust and confidence and relationships and um, we're fortunate to have some playgroup leaders who've been doing it for years and years and so they're really well known and really trusted in the community. Um, and as I said, no digital platform stood alone to reach out to families that people um, did um, drop-offs and one um, there was a great story about how a, a playgroup if there was a child who had a birthday during the stay-at-home time um, they'd arrange for other people to be able to drive past and toot um, and to reduce that isolation and that the feedback came that that was one of the things that was most valued by um, the families. Um, our youth services uh, did meal drop-offs and engagement over the fence during the April school holiday program when they'd normally have been running holiday activities. And um, people were incredibly uh, amazed about how much more connection this brought with the families of the young people. And they were pretty blown away by how much more widespread poverty was amongst their um, service users. Um, the Palmerston Indigenous Network that I'm a part of, um, that has um, been in existence for about five years, um, had concerns about families and um, whether that we needed to do more. And so they undertook to design a survey to find out if families had unmet needs and what supports might be most useful to them um, if the stay at home orders were extended. Um, if we provided welfare packs. And although the service, uh, the survey was provided digitally through SurveyMonkey and we all distributed it through all the many, many, many um, social media platforms around town, uh, not one single survey came back digitally. But uh, fortunately, some of the playgroup leaders asked the questions during their connection calls and the results were uh, really useful to us in thinking about this and um, also reminding us what a tried and true method that is of getting community voice is using, leveraging off the existing relationships. But what we found out from the survey, uh, we had about 75 respondents, which is a pretty small sample, but we found out that, you know, one of the most useful things to families was the increased Centrelink payments that enabled them to help <coughs> keep their families safe. But that at least 85% of the respondents um, still needed um, additional food and about 76% still needed help with personal care items like um, hand sanitizers and stuff because they were kind of in short supply for a while there. Um, about 56% of the respondents said they didn't get as much support as they wanted during that time um, and 38% of them said they would have um, could have done better if they'd had access to data. Um, for the internet so that they could, um, you know, tap into things that were going on. Um, another thing that we, I heard back from the Playgroup NT group was that they have, a, as well as their groups, they have a general um, Facebook site and that there were lots of visitors to that site that they've never seen before and that the visitors to the site didn't then come back to the face-to-face -face activities. Um, that could be because the um, we had to, because of the restrictions on amount of people able to use spaces, that we had a booking system and you'd have to get in early to book in. And that's still the case. Um, 
in April, the Youth Holiday Program um, also set up um, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots around the suburbs so that to discourage the young people from gathering in the town centres. Uh, and I understand they were really well used and well appreciated because it enabled young people to communicate with each other, but as well as their support workers. Now, the Tiwi Islands, hardly any of that was successful. Um, we have less activities, I guess, and um, it's pretty hard to contact people. Um, people have mobile phones and the data through mobile phones and people regularly, phones get smashed, phones get broken, people buy a new phone, so numbers change regularly. So it's pretty hard to keep in touch with anyone unless you're closely connected to them and therefore you know that they've changed their number. But if you're a service provider, there's no chance that you will know what their new numbers are. I'm noticing that more and more people are keeping their numbers now when they um, activate their new SIMs, but uh, it's still very sporadic. Um, if So we had a, a children's counselling activity. The counsellor couldn't fly there. Um, the, they would rely on the school, but most of the children stopped coming to school because um, the families wanted to keep them with them. And so most of that service broke down. We couldn't run any of the group activities, but we had one standout activity where the local Tiwi support workers just rose to the occasion and with the support from people on the mainland were able, and that's maybe phone support and freight, you know, things were sent over to them. There was a vehicle that they could use. They were able to go around to people's homes and um, just check that people, families with young kids understood how to keep their families safe and also how to engage with their families, which is um, what they were, would have learned in their um, activities. So they visited families who'd done their activities in the past and then they started visiting a group of families that would do the next round of activities when the lockdown ceased. So um, one of our challenges here for the future, because we can expect that this will happen again and it could happen much worse than it happened before, we've been blessed in the Northern Territory, is that how do we get, um, we have to upskill people on the Tiwi Islands who can deliver face to face and we need digital technology to support them and we need um, digital access, I guess. And that's just something that's on the Tiwi Islands is going to be hard to do. Um, but we can see in, in Palmerston that if we uh, dedicate some of our funds to making sure people have devices and have internet access, then there's more services that they'll be able to access. So that's me for that um, story. And I thank you for your interest and attention. And I'll just hand over to Annette now. Catch you later. All right. Thank you so much, um, Catherine. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people um, here in Sydney. I'm at Clavelli Beach, home of the Blue Groper, which hopefully some of you know about and you don't think it's something to do with nasty people in Parliament House, but it's a beautiful blue uh, fish. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging and of course Aboriginal people on the call uh, now, um, friends and colleagues, uh, thank you very much for being here today. Um, I have got some handouts, please um, access them as we go through. I'll try and remember to call out the number of the slides as I go through. Um, okay, I've really got three key messages today and I hope that they, um, really start to resonate given what Joe said, giving us that really broad national picture and um, and uh, this really um, detailed picture of uh, the challenges related to the digital divide, particularly in remote communities. Um, but the first thing to really say to you is that, and this is on slide three, telepractice for the place in the continuum of care. It's not an either or situation. We have to really embrace this blended model that we've kind of been forced into with COVID, but it's not gonna go away and it really has some potential. The second point is that you play an absolutely pivotal facilitative role. Um, that, I mean, that came out clearly uh, in both previous presentations that 
NGOs and indeed government organisations can play a key role in bridging the divide between uh, families who might have trouble with access and getting those families access. And the third key message is that telepractice provides really welcome options, particularly when in-person uh, in services aren't suitable or aren't accessible. Um, just by way of background, uh, the Parenting Research, the Parenting Research Centre, we are all about working with agencies to improve practice in line with best available evidence. So when COVID came along and the need to activate uh, opportunities to use technology more effectively, um, we were really keen to look at how nationally we could support good telepractice as part of the continuum of care. How could we support agencies to build a telepractice evidence base um, and what role could the Parenting Research Centre uh, play in that work? So just on slide seven, you can see we've been involved in four telepractice projects. The first one, just to let you know about, is um, the NGO telepractice venture, which we're leading with Karatani. Um, and that's really been a fantastic opportunity to work and partner with 15 different NGOs as part of a community of practice. Those NGOs uh, include, and I wanted to acknowledge them, um, uh, Aqua, Uniting, Social Futures, The Smith Family, Life Without Barriers and Key Assets, and also uh, a government department, the Department of Communities and Justice in New South Wales. And you can see from that range of organisations, they go across the continuum. So uh, like Red Cross, um, Smith Family provides things like Communities for Children and educational prevention activities right through to out-of-home care providers. So we've got people working across uh, kind of different groups of the population. Um, we have 15, a broader group of NGOs involved in that community of practice. We're identifying gaps. What, what help do we need to provide good telepractice? Um, and our project is about providing a structured approach to telepractice solutions. Um, the other three projects are funded by um, DHHS now, the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. I hope I've got that right in Victoria, the, name, the new name for the department in Victoria. That includes uh, a project that I'm really talking about today quite a bit, um, where we've got um, curated resources for um, practices in telepractice, so adapting from telehealth, but also things that are much more relevant to the child and family sector. Um, we're do undertaking a Delphi study to really start to understand um, expert consensus on good practice in this space. We've just started that work, and that's particularly looking at that family's experience in vulnerability. And we're also doing undertaking some research on how have parents uh, experienced uh, telepractice, particularly uh, more vulnerable families. So I'm drawing across these projects. I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, the wealth of um, uh, engagement from the particular groups. So some of the issues relating to the di digital divide, I think have been really well covered already by Joe. I'd probably just highlight um, a couple of things uh, that have come up through the work we've been doing. So. Um, working with different families, Aboriginal families needing to really take account of people needing to move around and how do we as service providers respond to that. Um, there's also the issue of families um, having a range of diverse caring responsibilities, agencies needing to acknowledge that and how we engage in a meaningful, uh, responsive way over the phone, over videos. Um, culturally and linguistically diverse families, particularly where families need interpreter services can be challenging. There are also, we've heard about invisible families who are suffering a kind of double whammy, those affected by lack of connectivity, so no internet and not able to access services in person. Um, and that being a real issue and being magnified during COVID where drop-in facilities, uh, events in shopping centres, and 
things might have gone online but where people can't access those uh, online activities have had a bit of a double whammy and the other area is trust and privacy issues has come up quite a lot uh, where people who are perhaps uh, really concerned for appropriate reasons about uh, government surveillance um, also really concerned about running up a bill from being on the phone or being on a digital uh, being on a video call um, can really get in the way of um, them being able to engage. So those trust and privacy issues are really important to think about. Um, some of the gaps, I'm just going through this reasonably quickly. These have really come out of the project uh, we, which we've co-led with Karatani and the 15 organisations in the community of practice. And this is on slide 11, where members of the community of practice who are really facilitating family engagement with services through telepractice um, were engaged in a survey with us and in that survey they identified what their telepractice needs were and then we went through a prioritisation exercise with them to work out which areas were priorities to work on. The four key areas that came up that we're now working on are working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families um, and I mentioned some of those issues previously, um, a lack of access to phones and uh, um, the examples we heard earlier are really clear examples of, uh, from Catherine, how, you know, some people are swapping phones, they don't even have access to phones. Um, we spoke to some people in the Kimberley, similar kind of information where people have gone back to country and were really, services were really having to adapt their ways of working during the pandemic. Um, working to suit phone contact and rather than uh, work of calling clients, clients, uh, because they didn't know quite when they were getting the phone and who would have access to the phone, clients phoning the workers instead. So having various workarounds because of the unreliability and sharing devices with people and having privacy issues there. And also checking in that people have got problems, spaces, et cetera. Uh, in terms of people with disabilities, making sure we are adapting our resources so they're easy to understand and easy to read. We've got quite a few complex instructions in a lot of our resources that we really need to dial back on. So really a lot of learning there as well. Um, responding to in-session risks, remembering quite a few of the services in our community of practice are working in the child protection, out of home care, um, family preservation space. So they're really keen to work out how do you do active planning for safe participation by children and families? What are the emergency procedures? How do you differentiate between concerning levels of disengagement and things where people are just disengaged because other things are going on around them? So, and engaging new families, can we organise uh, to loan phones? Um, can we organise ways of making sure people get access? So, just moving quickly to tips and uh, practices. So, how can we actually help clients access online services? Just a big caveat here, and this again talks to the structural issues here. Some of these issues are about big policy issues that we need to drive for and that internet access needs to be essential, an essential service that all Australians get access to. But beyond that, we there's, there are about three things, and this is on slide 14, to say there are definitely things services can do and are doing. So things like affordable data plans. Telcos often have some really good programs. Um, the second point, access to the internet on suitable devices either by lending out those devices, brokering and giving families those devices or looking for affordable options. And thirdly, that ability issue that Joe spoke to so eloquently, um, how can we uh, support skill development? And there are a number of great online programs, Be Connected, Digital Springboard. And I know some of those organisations go and do physical in-person training as well, recognising people uh, won't have access to online training if they don't know how to access it in the first place. So those are some of the uh, ideas um, and solutions that are coming up. Um, maximising, and the next slide, slide 16, just has some ideas about maximising privacy and confidentiality, because for, certainly for vulnerable clients, this is a real issue where there's abuse, there's violence. So who else is there? Who, who else can see what's going on? How does the client feel about that? 
also needing to protect the privacy of other people in the room, so there, so who, who around them needs to be protected. Closing documents on your screen and the client screen, so, so there's not inadvertent sharing. Things like discussing issues relating to recording of sessions. Sometimes in parenting sessions, you do want to role play and record, but do those things need to be deleted directly afterwards? Where will they be stored? And checking platform security and definitely work with your IT providers and the platforms you're using Using to make to make sure you've got up to date settings and security. Uh, so I'm just going back on slide 20, uh, slide 17 to my key messages. So telepractice is absolutely part of the continuum of care. Agencies play a crucial role, which is also why we need to make sure small and medium-sized agencies, uh, the 20% of agencies that don't have websites, how do we make sure we are supporting? those agencies who might have those tentacles out into remote uh, rural communities or access clients who wouldn't otherwise have access. Um, and the third point again, it's telepractice does provide some welcome options, particularly where in-person services aren't suitable or accessible. Specifically what we've been hearing from kind of a broad network of people we've been connecting with through the service system and directly is that offering um, in-home support can help some clients engage better. Some clients actually prefer not to have um, authority figures or workers coming into their home and a bit of distance can be helpful. Um, on the other hand, we also have examples where uh, we've had a dad who was being kind of ordered to, to, to undertake parenting programs, but he's a long distance truck driver. So it was very hard for him to get to um, a physical parenting program, but when the service went online and offered its parenting programs online, he was able to attend those sessions. So the change to telepractice means that he was actually able to get the support he needed. And interestingly and anecdotally, we found that the agencies are saying that more men and other co-parents have been able to engage a bit more since they get to telepractice. The next slide 18 has just got some resources for you to have a look at, uh, Be Connected, Digital Springboard and our website's got some great resources including the telepractice quiz. But I'll finish with the results of uh, our telepractice quiz, it's a bit of fun. Um, and thank you to the nearly 200 of you that have actually filled it out. If you haven't done it yet, do so after the webinar. Um, we've, got, we've got an average score of 57 out of 100, so the quiz is actually intended as both as an engagement tool, a way of people getting it to expand their thinking about telepractice, but we wanted to pick your interest in topics relevant to telepractice and get you thinking about areas you might want to learn more about. So here's a, just a couple of examples. Uh, question one was which of the following is the best definition of telepractice? This is on slide 19 and most of you chose the answer which is absolutely about providing services and supports from a distance. Question two uh, is about how do experts recommend you adapt your eye contact for telepractice? Um, now interestingly more on eye contact is recommended. 53% um, of you thought the same or less was better. Question three was about how do experts recommend you adapt your body language for telepractice? I should be doing more of this. Um, more expressive body language is actually needed, but only 35% of respondents chose that answer. On slide 20, just moving on, uh, what's the optimal length of a group uh, video conference for telepractice? Um, Generally speaking, it's recommended that you shorten your sessions, uh, but less than 44% chose this option. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, the question about the cheapest uh, device, um, uh, there's actually less than $100 uh, for a tablet, 30, and 32% knew, so about a third of people knew that uh, you could get tablets for that kind of thing. Kind of price. Uh, and lastly, um, what's the first yeah. thing you do uh, on, a, on a session? 60% of you chose the answer to double check that people can see or hear you. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of um, 
um, things to be aware of for the future. We are all learning so much and of course there is a lot more to learn. So thank you so much and now I will hand back to Annika. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. Uh, thank you, everyone, um, all three speakers today for some really interesting and really relevant presentations. I know we tried to pack in a lot today, um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I think today uh, it was a really good opportunity for us to think about how, you know, this adaptation to remote service delivery probably here to stay. We have to be nimble, we have to see ways that we can try and um, move between face-to-face -face delivery and you know we had that chance to start talking about how we can do that with the next presentation. Um, with Joe's presentation I think we really got a chance to understand where the digital divide exists, um, how certain populations including those facing socioeconomic disadvantage are particularly just digitally excluded. People also like single parents, mobile only users and there's a definitely a huge country to metro divide there. Catherine then definitely painted that picture for us and took us on that journey to NT where digital inclusion is a challenge whilst at the same time she also explained how you know there are ways um, to be innovative and practical about um, you know addressing these and whether that be through um, outlets like social media or using posts to actually get people on track and adapt to those challenges. Um, and like I said, and that really highlighted how some there's some practical ways to um, come through this and um, work out ways to work with your clients and really describe how the organization needs to be set up and really facilitate that support in order for um, remote service delivery or telepractice to be effective. So I guess I'll start off um, some questions for, possibly from me first, um, for the three of you, if I can join, uh, request you guys all to join me um, for a few minutes for some questions. Uh, my first question, I guess, um, as a practitioner myself, I think that we often make assumptions about what what is needed and, you know, in that circumstance, we don't really, really get time to think about it. and do we, as practitioners sometimes make assumptions about uh, remote service delivery or using telepractice and maybe that limits our confidence and use of it. Um, that was one of my questions that I had, which um, I don't know, maybe Catherine, we could start with you and your opinion on that. Um, yes. I, so can I just check that the question is, uh, do we make assumptions that are inaccurate? Yes. Um, yeah, um, so, uh, you know, the, everything that our service providers were able to do was predicated on the idea that people had digital access. And um, I guess we don't know, we currently do not know if they were accessing on a mobile device or whether they're accessing on their smart TV. Um, and we, we, uh, we kind of knew not to assume that people had internet at home, but we had no idea <clears throat> how, you know, um, in a short period of time, we could enable them to get that access. And if they would have the device, if they'd have, if we gave them a data bundle, whether they'd have a device and whether they'd know how to use it, because if, you know, they're not regularly exposed to it, then um, they wouldn't get it. So, um, and we always make assumptions as non-Indigenous people about Indigenous people's um, willingness and readiness to engage with us, let alone on a digital device. Absolutely. That's my thought. Yeah. And then did you have anything further about um, the kind of assumptions that often we have um, as practitioners and maybe in the other way as well that we sometimes expect, you know, that people don't have access. So I'm curious to know that your perspective with the types of people that you've been um, working with with your research. Yeah, look, I, I think um, uh, to Catherine's point, um, we are often hard to reach as service providers rather than thinking of, of, you know, clients as hard to reach. So, and I think, you know, with with um, digital access, it's up to us to think of ways of uh, communicating and supporting uh, bridging the digital divide and doing that in ways that, I think we do make assumptions, but it's really important that we listen to practitioners and services and find out 
what their thinking is and how we can map the gaps possibly between their thinking and some other ways of doing things. And I'm just thinking to Joe's point earlier that, you know, it's, it's, it's complex. I, I've been on three webinars this week using different technologies and I'm just struggling, you know, how do I share screens when I'm doing Zoom, Teams and this is go to. Uh, so, you know, we all need support and we're all learning. So that ability aspect, how do we make sure the workforce capacity is built alongside the client capacity? So that ability piece is central. Um, and sometimes that lack of confidence can get in the way of us using the tools. Um, and I know people generally are still more, much more comfortable with phone than with video. And I think there's evidence to support that in telehealth and that probably applies to telepractice as well. Absolutely. I think I'd add that, um, you know, we see colonising effects in the design of the technology as well. So there's assumptions being made does, by designers all the time. There's been some fantastic examples of genuine, you know, co-design. There's a, I won't go through them now because we don't have time, but um, where when we recognise the assets of the people that we're working with and we value the input that they have, then we come up with better, and it's, not, it's never universal, but more universal design than you can have when, frankly, um, a lot of uh, middle class white fellas get in a room together and get on the whiteboard. So, you know, I, d I think that there's a lot of scope for um, better co-design of the technology as well as services, where I know that that's a conversation that's quite alive. Okay, so one of the questions that we had from the audience was to Joe. Um, it was a question on how does data, how does the data, how is the data collected for the digital participation survey, and is it possible that it's skewed if the digit, if it was collected digitally? Um, it's not. It hasn't historically been collected digitally. Uh, it's collected through the Roy Morgan single source survey. And that is actually done face to face and it's a household based survey. Um, we're actually changing the data set this year and we've moved to original data collection. And that has involved collecting data both through online means and through uh, snail mail. Um, we're very aware of the um, problems of using digital technologies to measure digital inclusion and exclusion. So the next question is about what are some strategies to address and respond to the lived experiences of people affected by the digital divide? So I think this one's an interesting one because it talks not just about the practical aspects of uh, how do we you know, respond to the digital challenges, but also how do we address the lived experiences of people who have been affected by it? Um, I guess this question, I can throw it out to the group um, who would like to answer this question. Sure. I mean, we've reflected a little bit on this, and um, one of our one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we skill people up before the event, uh, before they're cut off, sort of thing. Um, and that means getting them devices and getting them, you know, someone to go to their home and help them learn to use it, and um, you know, talk about the you know sound and headsets and backgrounds and you know. Uh, looking after the device, I suppose, and um, how much data is going to get used up because naturally people will want to use it for their own connections as well. And, you know, we don't want, um, yeah, how much is enough data also um, to suit a family? And there's so, there's so many things, but it's about sort of setting it up beforehand, I guess, and um, enabling people to, you know, tell you what their issues are once they've had a had a try and some people may have more info, may have more uh, knowledge and information than we're assuming that they have too but there'll be we found that with some of our co-workers in the sector that when we had our um you know we had our network groups on zoom and things like that everybody somebody always had a problem of dropping out or more than, more than a few somebodies, we had much less participation than we would have if we had it face to face. And um, by the end of the shutdown time, we're all incredibly frustrated and just long to talk to each other face to face again so that we didn't have, you know, people with sound problems, people with dropouts, all those um, contingencies that are, are a problem. 
Yeah, that's really important to set up structures in advance so we can um, do things better the next time around. I guess we had to really adapt quickly and so people had to rely on what they had available this time um, when the when the shutdowns happened. But yeah, I feel like this whole experience has really given us a chance to really identify those gaps like what you mentioned, Annette, you know, where are those gaps coming out and um, where we can now target if we do want to continue at least some kind of hybrid model into the future. Um, for some people might prefer that as well. Do either of you want to talk to that point, uh, Joe and Annette, about what some strategies would be to respond to lived experiences? Yeah, um, I'm conscious of listening to Annette, so I want to hear what she's got to say, but um, I just quickly say, I mean, the way I interpret that question is how are we going to deal with the after effects of this exclusion? Um, yes. And, and I think that, I mean, this is where we've, paid a lot of attention to the very critical importance of medical science in terms of preparing vaccines, but we also need to pay attention to the critical importance of social science, good inclusive social science, to understand, because there's going to be a long tail on this, particularly in areas to do with education and work, um, and we are, there's going to, we're going to need to pay attention to people's experience and think about what kinds of remedies and design changes need to occur to respond. Um, so there's no question it's a really critical issue, but I'm actually really interested to hear from Annette about what she has to say. <laughs> uh, well, look, there's a, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of key things here. I think one of the groups, because of our um, community of practice, uh, are kind of slanted towards highly disadvantaged children, particularly child protection and outcome care, we are really concerned about, um, yet again, children in the care system being at the front line where they're educationally disadvantaged and, you know, there's been remote schooling. Um, there, there's a whole rise of concern around uh, children's use and monitoring children on the internet and, you know, are they accessing inappropriate um, websites also are they engaging in harmful are they engaging and exhibiting harmful sexual behaviors themselves often children in out of home care are kind of in that space either targeted or um, involved in some of those behaviors for a whole range of reasons and trauma you know there's connections bet between trauma and those kind of activities anyway so real concern that yet again, the most disadvantaged will get the double, triple whammy. So we're very concerned and are you know, keen to talk to other agencies and funders about well, what are we gonna do? Do we need to look at the package of supports, digital supports we put around children and carers? The other thing is kinship carers are often in that and carers are often in that 50 plus group, you know, that original, they may be considered kind of in that older age group in terms of uh, less ability. Um, but the over 65s, we know from Joe's research again, are, might have the uh, accessibility and ability issues. And carers often are older Australians. So that's a real concern for us. Um, and in terms of lived experience, there's a lot to learn in terms of some of the positive things we can take away from people um, using digital technology to choose when to come in and out of session. So we've noticed in some of the parenting groups, people just clicking off and saying, oh, I just, I just had a bit of a technical issue. We suspect sometimes it's just getting too much and people just want to just get away from it for a while, but they're coming back and they're coming back to the next session. So there's some interesting things about that, but we don't know. We haven't got the evidence for that yet. These are just little anecdotal stories that need to be put together. So we need Joe and others to do the research. As I said, we're doing a small research project in Victoria about Victorian parents' experiences of the kind of lockdown and digital uh, inclusion and technology. So that will be very important, I think, to get some of those stories from the research so we can go beyond the anecdote. Yeah, it's a really interesting one because it's not just about 
what do we do um, better, but how do we then mitigate some of the damage control that occurred, you know, during that period, people have been like possibly scarred through that whole experience of um, that digital exclusion, making divisions even further greater in society. So we almost have to now go, not just solving, but also like, going further to try and reintegrate people back into wanting to um, seek out services sometimes because uh, of, 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 you know, difficulties having to have done that in a very mandatory way. One more practical question, I think. Uh, this one alludes to a little bit about what you were saying, Annette, towards the end of your talk, about whether there are any suggestions for affordable device options and packages where costs could be included into the program budget or provide immediate and long-term options for isolation users so is there any like options for them I think it's really important that the service system and service providers particularly ones that have advocacy avenues through their peak bodies are advocating for these packages of care that it is essential it's an essential service to be connected so how do we ensure that um, people accessing our system can access our system so I think there's a there's a real advocacy piece there but some some funding bodies do give organizations brokerage so why are why are people need to use their brokerage funds to either give people devices or give people data packs or lend them to them during the duration and that is absolutely happening the Smith family is doing some really good work around giving um, as part of, I think it's part of Learning for Life, but they give devices to children. But we also need parents to have devices as well. So, you know, how do we package that up? So I think there's some really good opportunities and we need to advocate for this kind of, um, the access. But the other piece of that is making sure people have the skills they need to that ability thing and making sure we, use mentoring and coaching so that people can use those things uh, with, with confidence and be part of and included in the whole community. That's a really good one. Um, did either of you, Joe or Catherine, have any further examples like non, non-for-profits or anyone that's really trying to address this gap for um, these isolated communities at all? We did have the experience with um, the FAST program of um, them getting to a point where they started doing, not knowing how long shutdown was going to happen, they um, started doing some training online, but with their um, family, their, you know, family people who were going to become the facilitators of their activity. And um, again, that just relied that people would have those devices and have that internet access. Um, and we did talk about the thing about using their money, their brokerage money, or whether we needed to find some more funds for them to subsidise um, internet packages for people. But we didn't have to do it in the end because the you know the stay-at-home orders were lifted and people were by the by the beginning of semester two, people were able to meet face to face in small groups, and that was a small group activity. Do the presenters have any sense of whether people are getting get better service through traditional face-to-face -face delivery or is telepractice equally successful? This is a big question. Um, it's not easy to answer, um, especially because I've been in that space too. But does, does anyone have a, a feeling towards answering that question? I've got one thought and it uh, came up for me when Annette was speaking, the idea about cyber security is, is a, an issue of concern in particularly in Aboriginal communities. I find um, that where um, young people are accessing social media, there can be a lot of harshness and bullying like behaviour um, that no one else is necessarily aware of. So that's um, parents um, probably need a lot of support there to be aware of what those risks are and whether there is anything they can do about it. Um, so cyber safety, and I had been talking that I think there's a mob called Digimob or something like that who um, do things for Aboriginal communities. And when I've met them at events, I've said, what are you doing about cyber security? <laughs> um, and I, they, did, they weren't doing anything at the time at the last Barunga Festival when I spoke with them about it, but uh, that's a few years ago now because we couldn't have a Barunga last year. In, I mean, in terms of, um 
in terms of parenting programs and interventions, there is there is some uh, emerging evidence. I think um, Triple P online uh, is doing kind of uh, proper RCTs on um, whether uh, they're getting the same results from the online version. I know internet-based um, parent-child interaction therapy is getting equal results to um, Face to face. That's an interesting one because the therapist actually sits behind the two-way screen in that program anyway. So it lends itself incredibly well to the 12 sessions that are held. Um, uh, and um, I know Karatani uh, is has been trialing that and getting very good results. And I think there's an international study of internet-based parent-child interaction therapy. So there's certainly some evidence that um, it can be effective. And you know, there's obviously that whole world of telehealth and uh, um, tele mental health where there is some, some emerging evidence. But it kind of you have to look at the design. Um, and but there, there is certainly emerging evidence in some circumstances. But when we're talking about the digital divide, obviously that only is going to work for families and parents that can access. The internet in the first place to that previous point that if we do if we do want families to have that as a choice because it suits them you know the the, the program's being run at eight o'clock at night when when a working parent can actually pretty well get there um they have to have connectivity if they haven't got that they can't attend so that you know that that barrier can still exist which is to that point about how can we Create packages and ensure this as an essential service because this is this is um, you know post COVID people still need blended models of care I think definitely definitely um, one other question I thought was really interesting I think we did touch on it um, during the presentations as well is how do you work with families via telepractice when there are safety concerns such as domestic violence for example when the perpetrator is in lockdown with the victim during COVID that was one I think you might have mentioned it in yours but you know is there any strategies that you can put in place to help help support those those types of clients uh, yeah, look, that so that's come up as a really big area of concern. Again, the group we're working with um, in that community of practice are generally working. Say, eighty percent of their clients are in uh, experiencing domestic violence. So, and it's a child protection context. So, very concerned about how you handle risk. And we are actually just working on uh, a series of materials for responding. So um, many organisations ha have developed policies and procedures around kind of risk assessments online and what you can do when there's risk and what you can't do. And some are saying, you know, you kind of have to do a face-to-face -face assessment where there's domestic violence or where you're doing, a, you know, you're the um, Child Welfare Authority, you have to go in person. But beyond that, when you are a family worker in the community who still is experiencing these kind of risky situations, what are some things you can put in place? So we are just working that up. It, it's going to go through a process of um, uh, we're doing kind of um, uh, rapid cycle testing of these products to make sure they work with practitioners. But the plan is after we've done some testing that that would go, be open access and on um, our website and, and other people's websites too. So kind of watch this space. We have got some information already on our website about this. But we'll have yeah, seen yeah. resources. Yeah, I've seen those. Um, excellent. So I think that's a really good overview. I think if we want, we can have time for one last question. It's a bit of a broader question. I do feel like um, all, of, all three of you have already spoken about examples, but I guess people are really, uh, our audience is really interested in examples of agencies on what they've done. So are there any other places that they can check out in terms of online, other webinars, web pages? where people can see what examples of what other community organisations have done to adapt to remote service delivery and how they've actually tried to address the digital divide. Yeah, um, I'm, I imagine that um, people involved in this conversation have got their own networks of sharing 
experiences and resources, etc. Um, within the sort of not-for-profit landscape in Australia, the Info Exchange Group, which includes connecting up an Info Exchange, is one group that I think you know uh, plays a has played a long-term active role in understanding the digital access and um, and digital innovation potential of not-for-profit organisations. I can't speak to specific resources that they've got online, but they've got such a legacy in the era, area, I imagine that there's some resources there. One of you mentioned, one of my uh, co-presenters men just mentioned the Digimob. Um, mm -hmm. There's quite a lot, and again, recognising the irony of encouraging people to go online to think about digital inclusion, there's actually quite a lot of um, really good sharing that goes on through some of the social media platforms. Twitter in particular um, has quite an active sort of digital inclusion and civil society presence. Um, mm -hmm. And that really is about, you know, if, you've, if you're on Twitter is um, searching for particular hashtags and particular names. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, just kind of more on the service side, because those examples Joe gave up are really brilliant actually. Uh, Karatani pivoted to 100% online delivery within two weeks because they've got quite a lot of experience. So things like their, um, they went to virtual, you know those sleep clinics where you've got a cry, your baby won't stop crying and you go and do a residential sleep clinic. They pivoted to doing that completely online um, within two weeks and they've, they've actually kept that service going. But they have a lot of experience and I think they're going to be publishing some of their resources. They've done a couple of talks on on a very practical level, the things you need to have in place, both in the preparation phase, engagement phase and ongoing phase to support this blended model of care. They've got a great diagram on the continuum of care that they develop. So that's one organisation that's ahead of the curve. I know we are planning on getting some materials together with organisations like Catholic Care, Volcania Forbes, um, Uniting, Key assets who are working with the Aboriginal Community Control Organisation in Kununurra, whose name escapes me, because they're doing some brilliant work. We want to have some of those case studies available from our project in the next couple of months. So hopefully we can share, because I think you're right, those practical examples can just bring it to life a little bit more for people. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you all uh, for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Until then, stay safe and have a really good week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anita.